for the Universidad Estatal a Distancia, the School of Social Sciences and Humanities, and the English teaching major for first and second cycles. It is a pleasure to have your presence in the webinar, The Assessment Journey, Concepts for an Effective Classroom Implementation by Martin Caicedo from Oxford University Press. Before we begin with this activity, we want to explain the dynamics of this webinar. We appreciate you keep your mics and cameras off at all times to avoid interruptions during the webinar. With the purpose of maximizing the time for every session, we invite you to ask your questions in the chat of this Zoom session. These questions will be written down by our organizing committee and we will share them with the specialist following the posting order in the chat. We advise you to verify that when posting your questions, you are sharing them with the whole group of the session. If any question cannot be answered in this session, the organizing committee will send it to the specialist and he will send the answer via email to the participants of this seminar. Martin Caicedo holds a master's degree in English language teaching for self-directed learning from Universidad de la Sabana, Colombia, a graduate diploma in TESOL from Anaheim University, USA, and a specialization in educational management from the Universidad San Buenaventura, Colombia. With more than 19 years of experience in the ELT field, Martin has whole positions such as school and university professor, academic director for the Binational Center Colombo Americano Pereira, head of English department Liceo Taller San Miguel Pereira, national program coordinator for the Ministry of Education's Colombia Bilingue program, amongst others. He currently works as well as adjunct professor at the Master of English Didactics at Universidad de Caldas, Colombia. He has extensive experience in training teachers in Spain, Germany, France, Czech Republic, Colombia, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Peru, and Chile. Without further ado, let us welcome Mr. Caicedo. Hi, Akira. Thank you so much, and thank you to UNED for the invitation. As always, it's an honor for me to be here and to be in this very important event. Um, I can see that we have 21 people in the room. Welcome, and thank you so much for accepting the invitation of coming here to this webinar uh, entitled Assessment Journey, Tips for Effective uh, Classroom Implementation. Basically, what we want here is to work around the concept of assessment. And perhaps many of these topics are not new to you. And I'm pretty sure that many of these concepts have been already implemented by you in your classroom. My objective is to brush up on those concepts, is to refresh them, to talk about them, to mention some effective tips that we know that we have to care about, but maybe we just overstep it or just misuse them or just uh, overlook them because we're too busy with our current teaching practices. And even so more today, when we have these new hybrid, alternate, virtual, semi-presential way to teach uh, because of the pandemic has brought on to us. So one more time, uh, I'm, I'm hope that uh, we can have a, a time to, to go back to those concepts around assessment, around testing. And maybe we can just uh, give that position, that place that assessment deserves. And uh, why not we can have some aspects, some concepts to discuss, to talk, and to reflect. We're gonna be collecting questions at the end. So please, in, in a presidential mode, a face-to-face -face mode, we're gonna be having a chat, a conversation. But our virtual environment in which we are now, it just requires this kind of methodology. So first of all, um, yes, I, I work for Oxford University Press. I work as a regional assessment specialist. Specialist comes like a fashion name to say that I'm a assessment geek. I love assessment. I've worked with assessment for, exclusively for assessment with assessment for almost 10 years now. 
uh, I've, uh, I think that, that for me, assessment is central to a teaching practice. Because uh, one thing that I learned from a teacher uh, back when I was at the university was that whatever you can't measure, you can't improve. So how can I know that I have to, I have to improve something if I don't measure it, if I don't have some guy to tell me that we are making progress or not? So all of this conversation is going to be something like a salpicón, a tutti frutti, in which we're going to have different concepts, different ideas. But in the end, it's going back to that very initial uh, tenant, that principle, assessment for the sake of teaching. Assessment for the sake of teaching. Not assessment just because, but assessment for the sake of teaching. I'm gonna share my screen now and uh, forgive me if I don't get to see your comments because it's gonna be full screen, so I'm gonna be able to see the chat, but Tobias very kindly is gonna help us with that. So give me just one second and perhaps Tobias, can you confirm that uh, the screen can be, can be seen? Yes, we can see it. Perfect, just, let me just hold it up. Okay, so first of all, I work for Oxford University Press. Oxford University Press is a department of the University of Oxford. And I'm gonna play a video. I'm not certain, Tobias, and maybe you can confirm if the audio can be heard because I'm wearing my, my wireless microphone headset thingy. So I don't know if it's gonna come up. Let me know. If no, we just leave it mute because it okay, comes with the titles. Okay, thanks. Yes, perfect. Oxford University Press is a thriving international publishing organisation, but it's also a department of the University of Oxford. It exists to further the university's objectives of excellence in research, scholarship and education by publishing worldwide. I think the sound stopped, Martin. So, uh, as part of 
the uh, University of Oxford, Oxford University Press has a division that is the ELT division, which we are part of. And our intention is to participate with our allies and to help our allies into this spaces in which we can really transmit our, our, our knowledge, our expertise in the publishing, research, and education worldwide. Okay, now today the topic that brings us here is the assessment journey. And uh, the assessment journey, when we talk about that, it might sound like a new concept, like something that we are just starting to see, but in fact, it's not. The assessment journey is everything we do in this path we put our students on towards the achievement of uh, a goal, of an objective. And uh, once again, what we want here, what I want here, is for us to touch base and refresh those, those topics that we normally use them in the classroom, but sometimes we do it in automatic mode, in the auto mode. It's a mechanical action, and perhaps it's time for us to stop a bit and think a little bit further on what we do when, we when it comes to assessment. Because the assessment journey is everything when it comes, or it's a central part when it comes to a teaching process. And assessment and testing is, and I recognize, is not one of the hottest topics for English language teaching professional or any social sciences professional per se. To give you just a statistics, in, in Colombia, where I'm from, and what I'm based on right now, in Colombia, we have um, these faculties of English language teaching programs in which we prepare, we give in-service training to teachers who go out and teach in the public and private sector. In 2010, a study was run amongst all these faculties, and it was found that in the curriculum, in the study plan of these uh, around 67 faculties in Colombia, only 23% actually had a subject called assessment or testing or evaluation. In the other part, it's only like a spare part of all topics or other subjects. So in that sense, in that matter, we're not saying, and they are not saying that it's not important, but they put it together into the fabric of the same program, the very same fabric of the program. And perhaps we need to dedicate a little bit more thought, a little bit more thinking time into how we are implementing our assessments, how my testing, my assessments are impacting my students. Because assessment is not maybe the funniest of the topics or the subjects, and, uh, but it is a sensitive matter. And it's so sensitive, sensitive enough to be used to get people killed. Wow, that's harsh. Are, how are you guys teaching Colombia? Are you killing because of assessment? No, 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 no. But the earliest reference to assessment, to language assessment, comes from the Bible itself. And I don't know if you heard the story that said that shibolet or sibolet or how a mispronunciation could cost you your life. So the story goes something like this. In the story, two Semitic tribes the Ephraimites and the Gilidites, I'm talking about Old Testament, they had a great battle. They were always in battle and different battles and they had the last battle, one against each other. So in that, the Gilidites defeat the Ephraimites and set up a blockade across the Jordan River to catch the fleeing Ephraimites who were trying to get back to the territory. Now imagine this, they're in a war, but they are very close. Actually, it's pretty, like they're sharing everything. They share culture, they share language, they share uh, relatives, they are friends, they are, but they are because of religious and different topics, they were at war for many, many years until they had this last battle. Now, they put a blockade on the road in the Jordan River to divide both of the tribes, the winning one and the one that was defeated. And uh, they were trying to get back to a country, the one that were defeated, they were trying to get back to a country and they had to go across that barrier. Now, how would they pass? Well, the sentries, the people who were just watching the crossroad, the, cross the blockade, asked each person who wanted to cross the river 
to say the word shibboleth. The word shibboleth. Now, the Ephraimites, who had no sh sound in the language, pronounced the word with an S, shibboleth, and were thereby unmatched as the enemy and they'll be slaughtered. So just because a little difference in pronunciation, the one, the winning ones, they pronounced it shibboleth, but the one who lost the battle, they didn't have the sh sound. So they had the S sound, the sound, and they would pronounce it shibboleth. So right then and there, they would know that they were for the, or the other uh, the tribe and there would be a slaughter. That's language assessment. Now, of course, we don't kill people anymore for that, but our new shibboleth, and this is our shibboleth, is definitely called test anxiety. There are many factors that are around this topic of assessment, which is very important, of course, but test anxiety has come to one of the first reasons why um, the tests are being overlooked or they are not being precisely designed, thinking or taking into consideration our students and our teachers as well. So when we talk about test anxiety, there are many other, of course, there are many other aspects, but we're gonna just talk for a little while about, let's talk about test, test anxiety. Now, test anxiety is a state of anxiety. It's a context-specific anxiety in a specific to testing situation that impacts students' performance on the test, thus inhibiting the test score as an accurate reflection of academic knowledge and skill. Of course, we create a great test. We teach our students. We dedicate time to planning, to teaching, and to assessment. But the anxiety that comes with it, it just hinders students' performance, whether we like it or not. Once upon a time, was a while ago, I was a, a academic director of a, one of the largest institutions in my region. And I had under me 80 teachers. 80 teachers whom maybe 70 to 80, maybe 90% had lived in an English-speaking country. They had studied in an English-speaking country. They were uh, they are pretty much native. The only one, the only thing that they had like a Colombian or Latin Americans were their names or last names. And our institution decided that in order for us to guarantee that our teachers met the requirements, they had to take uh, a certification test. And uh, they did, and they took the IELTS. Amazingly, teachers who had earned the bachelor's degree the master's degree, and the one who have lived for many years in an English-speaking country. And when you hear them, you knew that they were practically native speakers. They wouldn't, they wouldn't get anything higher than a B2. They have a B2 plus. Why was that? We started this research and we started to talk to those teachers, trying to figure out what had happened. It was a test, it was us, where they came with hangover to do the test, whatever. And uh, we realized from, through talking to them that the, the thing that they knew English, they know they know English, but when it comes to the test, the anxiety measure, the anxiety spikes up. So that hindered their, their performance during the class, during the test. And uh, there are many consequences around test anxiety. For example, um, it affects the students in the long term. Younger students, for example, when they, you are assessing, testing younger students, they are always optimistic and rely on the support from the teachers and rewards to feel that they are doing well and progressing. So the feedback is very important for them. By the time the students are in middle school, teenagers, so things change and they feel that Everything, everything that we think as teachers about them comes down to whatever they get in the test course. So that's producing anxiety, not only at a pedagogical curricular level, but also at the personal level as well. But you know what? It's not only students who feel anxiety from tests. Teachers as well, we feel anxiety. 
And teachers, and why, according to research, is because teachers are being put under a scrutiny over their classes scores, which is affecting their curriculum and teaching methods. For teachers who have underscoring students and need to raise the class's average score, teachers are turning to methods such as memorization and drilling tactics. So basically what we're doing as teachers when we know that our students are gonna be scored, graded or judged with a test at the end of the year of the program. So we start just preparing them for that goal. We forget about teaching. We forget about English. We concentrate on giving them strategies, drilling strategies, for example, for them to pass the test is what we call teaching to the test. And of course, this gives, this gives little room for students to learn. But in this teaching style, they are more likely to score well on the standardized testing. And when I talk about standard testing, I don't want it to be a, a bad word. I don't, I don't mean it in a bad way. We must have standard testing. A standard testing, we must have it. It's not that it's an option. We got to have it. With the assignment journey, we are trying to just convey a message. It's not only about standardizing testing, but also using different methods and approaches around testing, around assessment, so that we don't rely solely on one source of information. Even in some countries, there has been evidence to suggest that because of the risk of termination of the contracts, teachers are becoming competitive about raising their test scores. This means that teachers are less likely to collaborate with one another on teaching strategies because they want to receive a bonus, should they have it, or they want to confirm just what they want to, that they're gonna have their contract renewed. So everything goes around, of course, the fact or the premise of the anxiety. Anxiety has can be just seen in different forms, in different ways. When you're sweating, you you it's hard for you to think clearly. You have rapid breathing, rapid heart rate. You have tummy ache. And you're trembling your legs. So all these are the physical manifestation of the anxiety, and that is present. And of course, we cannot be so naive to think that uh, assessment or testing will not bring up a little bit of anxiety, but as we just can't rely on our teaching into just that test that produces anxiety, or we're considering different methods and approaches to, in order for us to really verify our students' achievement, achievement of the learning goal. And uh, this meme, I found it coming across the presentation, and uh, I loved it. I loved it because it says a lot. Could you start when you're a student and you go back to your to, to times you, when you were a student in high school, taking a standardized test. And uh, you, you when you start answering, answering, and at some point you doubt yourself. And what you do is going back and you doubt what you already answered. So how reliable is a test score in which anxiety plays a larger role than actually demonstrating competence in English? All right. So let's remember that the right implementation of an assessment journey can help decrease test anxiety, promote engagement, and avoid teaching to the test amongst others. So there are many, many um, uh, advantages that we have with when we have uh, our assessment journey well set according to our students and not thinking only about what I'm going to teach, but what I'm going to teach how I'm gonna get there, how I'm gonna to get to my learning objective, and how I'm gonna I'm gonna corroborate that the learning objective has been met. Okay. So before we move on, let's do a little bit of a, a concept checking review. I'm gonna ask you to please go to this website that I'm gonna put on the side in a moment. Go to this website and type the code that you can see on the screen. I'm gonna just share here. This is Socrative, I'm pretty sure that you know this. So please go to this website. I'm gonna try just to quickly, I'm gonna stop sharing so that I can copy the link and put it in the chat box. 
Okay, give me one second. Excellent. So I'm going to show you really briefly how it works, okay? So I'm not going to go over the explanation of the features. I'm just going to show you why I think it's useful and what we can do with it. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen again. But this time, let's go take a look at this part, all right? Now, what you can see here is Socrative. This is a free app. I don't use anything paid, to be honest. And I don't think any teacher actually do. We just uh, use whatever is for free on the system. And I, I prepared this quiz, this really simple quiz. I prepared it and uploaded it online. I selected some features and then I send it out live for people to answer. Anyone can answer it as long as they have the room code, which is this one, which I unfortunately didn't give it correctly the first time. So here I have the result. Here I didn't want to get names, but, and so it created a just random name, but you can ask your students to, or you can design the test so that students type down their names. You can see exactly what the problems are, okay? So here you have a score. It makes us a mathematical calculation, 100%, all answers correct, and uh, the division of the ones that you haven't gotten correct. So here are, you have a score, 67, uh, so on and so forth. So you can have, first you have a snapshot and you see exactly how the level of understanding of the topic that you're teaching is. Now, if you want to get a little bit more in depth, so you can start, for example, clicking and you can see down here, and this is an analysis that you can have it um, vertical or horizontal. Here you can have the percentage of correct question, the correct answers for that specific question. And this is part of one of the concepts of assessment journey, which is using data to pinpoint the needs and apply improvement plans. I'm sorry, I just want to make a, a, a little note here. Right now, I'm, as I, I'm presenting, I'm not, I'm not able to see a chat box, okay? So forgive me if I can't see your question. I'm gonna address them in just one minute when I finish just going over the, the dashboard. So here you can have an analysis. In this column on the left, you can see a score each student got. And you can identify your strongest student versus your weakest student. And you can make an analysis here, which is a general group in which which questions got the higher correct answers. So for example, here we can say how this question number two had the highest correct answers. So you can quite fairly imply or yeah, you can imply that this question is a topic that a student haven't really netted down. So that's question number two. And you can click each of the questions to see exactly what question you're trying to address. So for example, this one was the one that had the highest correct answers. And these are four of pre-assessment pre -assessment where teachers can evaluate the students. Of course, in this case, you can see a results here is diagnostic. And you can have a really in-depth analysis in, okay, 80% of your students got it correct. 7% got summative, epistative, non-reference. See? So you can have really a really cool understanding. Let's go one by one. For example, the first one, type of a standardized test that compares students' performances to one another. These assessments compare a student's performance to the course median. So what is the correct one? Is a non-reference one, you see? So you can tell that you can see that this is, if you were a teacher, if I were a teacher who is teaching assessment or testing principles in a university, I would use this information as part of my assessment journey to identify that this is one of the topics that I have to reinforce because the numbers were not as good as expected. Uh, then we did this one already. Question number three refers to a wide variety of methods that teachers use to conduct in-process evaluation of student comprehension, learning needs, and academic progress during a lesson, unit, or course, okay? So who answered? All my students answered. And the result is formative assessment, right? 
which is actually, I'm sorry, but it's a little mistake here. Oh no, variety of method. Yeah, no, it's fine. I was missing with another one. So this is a formative assessment. This is the definition. And I can see how uh, almost half of my students got it right. So once again, this is telling me something. I need to reinforce this concept. I can use that to improve my teaching. And it's exactly what I told you at first. We need to use assessment, not just for the sake of having a grade, but design in such a way that I can use that data to inform my teaching and improve it. Question number four, measure student performance against a fixed set of predetermined descriptors. So what is the result of the answer here? Is criterion or criterion reference. Almost half of the people got it right. So I can tell that I need to reinforce this concept too. Question number five, is this use development student learning skill acquisition and academic achievement at the conclusion of a defined instructional period, typically at the end of a project, unit, course, semester, program, or school year. So there is the answer is summative assessment. 73 of the people got it right. It is telling me as a teacher that this is a concept that is well-founded on my students. One more time, I'm using assessment, not just for the sake of assessment, but to inform me where I need to make more of my work. And finally, question six, the practice of determining a student's progress based on their area work. And here we have Ipsative, 27 people, 20% of the people got it right. I always, when it comes to Ipsative, I gave the example that is as when, when you play video games, that you get a score today and you want to improve that score tomorrow. So that is an Ipsative assessment. You are being, or you are assessing yourself against your previous score. So this is Socrative, I love it. And that you can just go ahead here and just when you finish the test, you finish it and just click on finish and you can share it, you can export it. If you need to make some sort of analysis, for example, I get the full results in Excel. I can download it on my, on my hard drive. I can email them to me or I can save it to a Google account. So when I get that, I get the same view that I got a little bit before, but in an Excel file. So I can start making a statistical measure. I can know the average, I can get a grade, I can make a little formula and transform that grade or that score that they got into a grade. So different aspects, different options, but this is one of the concepts of assessment journey. Not Socrative, but the concept of using assessment and test data for the sake of learning, not just for the sake of grading, okay? Good, so now we knew where we are at right now. I'm gonna stop again here, good. Uh, yes, Akira, you are really, really right and correct. We use this and we should be using it once again. I'm not vouching for Socrative. There are many other parts which I'm, apps which I'm sure that they have more features, more options than this one. But again, after you teach for a while, you get used to your set of weapons of choice that you get to use to use. So this is mine. I recommend it, but it also as I recommend it, I feel I have the, the obligation to, uh, to caution to the overused, okay? So assessment journey is the use of many approaches, different approaches, different tools for the goal of uh, our student or verifying or corroborating our, our students' level of English. Okay, when I go back to my presentation right here, just uh, right now. Okay. Good. So let's continue reviewing some basic concepts. Remember that we have something that is called testing and another different thing, which is assessment. Testing is defined as a product that measures a particular behavior or set of objectives. So the test that you did, that, that you create, the, the, the exam, the, the oral presentation, that yields a grade 
that's a test. On the other hand, assessment is seen as a procedure instead of a product, okay? A procedure instead of a product. Testing, applying tools, applying products. Assessment is a, pro a procedure of collecting information during and after instruction has taken place, okay? Now, another concept that we need to have really in mind when we're designing our tests, our assessments, is the concept of formative assessment, in which is using a method to inform students of gaps in the learning. It's not formative if I wait for this assessment to be applied at the end. If I apply the assessment at the end, it automatically becomes a summative assessment because I'm creating, I'm, I'm, I'm emitting a, a, a judgment of the process, okay? Whereas formative assessment is during the process, okay? It helps also, and this is something that has been overlooked. And let's just see these three, this is these three principles. So it is also useful to familiarize the students with the expectation of summative assessment. And key, this is crucial, it is useful providing feedback that guides the direction of a student learning, okay? So ideally, and unlike summative assessments, formative assessments should occur in a non-threatening environment, anxiety-free environment, and to be offered at a time that is applicable to the student's learning journey, and be one where the student takes an active part of the process. So when we talk about formative, formative always goes together with the word feedback. Immediate, applicable, a specific and timely feedback, okay? Formative means I know where your progress, I know where your learning gaps are, I know where your learning weaknesses and strengths are, and this is what you have to do in order to get to the achievement of the goal. Okay, so the progress of the students will only be enhanced by formative assessment if they are able, students are able to use that knowledge, that specific knowledge to effectively recognize where they need to develop their learning of skills. See, so formative is important. Formative is not the only one. And I want us to concentrate on the second statement familiarizing the students with expectations of summative assessment. Because formative assessment has been romanticized over the last years. Because first, 25, 30 years ago, everything was summative, everything was discrete, discrete point, everything was very, let's say, strict and rigid, and the tests were the only thing we did and we used in order to have our students evaluate it. Then a change came with psychology and behavioral education that said, look, assessment and testing should not, cannot, must not be threatened. It must be like um, walk in the park, yes? And right now we're just circling back and meeting ourselves in the middle saying, look, we do need summative assessment. We do need tests. We do need scores. I mean, that's for sure. Now." But we also need formative assessment. We need feedback. We need non-threatening tools for our students to know where they are and how much they need to improve in order to get where they need to be. But we need to start using that formative assessment, not just like an open, free will, willingly kind of assessment. No, let's use that formative assessment also to familiarize our students with the expectations of summative assessment. How do we do that? Key tool, key question, not the only one, not the only one, rubrics. Rubrics are key, I'm gonna be talking about that in a moment. Rubrics are key for our students to first know what the expected performance is, understand and we and we can communicate our expectations but if we get points we give grades also helps our students to familiarize look 
yes, this is what you need to do. And if you get this, you're gonna gain or obtain this grade, okay? Now, remember, we have tests and we have assessments. We have tests in the form of quizzes, midterms, and finals that conforms the summative assessment. And we have assessments that observations, peer assessment, group assessment, portfolios, and many others that are called formative assessment. Why? Because it doesn't necessarily lead or has the pressure of a test grade, but it can be useful in order to provide feedback for our students in the learning process. Now, let's go back to the concept of assessment journey. And our assessment journey, which means using different tools, using different resources for evaluating our students, encompasses the systematic and methodical use of different types of educational assessment tools, and are providing enough valid and reliable, never do forget these two concepts. Something has to be, an assessment has to be valid and reliable. Information that allows stakeholders make decisions regarding performance of those evaluated, okay? And when we have formative assessments and we have summative assessment and we put them together in our assessment journey and we use summative tools and we use formative tools, we're gonna end up having a 360 assessment. And this 360 assessment gives us a whole round concept and a whole round view of what our students are able to do, okay? And assessment is not free of controversy, of course. So some basic principles that spark up discussion and controversy and controversy are, of course, those that have to do with the design of tests and test environment themselves. For example, let's think about these ones. Assessment will hardly be easy or anxiety-free for students. All assessments should be summative. Wash back in testing depends on the teacher. We're going to have a little space for a conversation here, but again, I'm not uh, I, I'm not able to see a chat, and uh, so it might take us a little bit less beautiful, a little bit further along. But let's analyze this, okay? Because much have been said have been said around the environment and the testing. And some teachers, some linguists, some experts says that, look, no matter how you design your testing, your assessment, your assessment journey, it will hardly be easy or anxiety free for students, okay? And actually it can be true and it might be true because when we are taking a test, we are prone to be judged. Judge means that another person is making a judgment, is making a conclusion, is creating a concept on me, about me. So that comes with a heavy psychological burden to the student's shoulders, because I'm being judged. Therefore, no matter what test you use, formative assessment, summative assessment, portfolios, at some point, that thing that I'm doing, that assessment that I'm doing is gonna come with a judgment. And judgment means somebody saying whether, whether I am good or bad. Second one is all assessments should be summative. And uh, this is a kind of, uh, of a, a, a discussion, a debatable concept, but some people, some teachers do agree with it and say, look, it's fine that you use portfolios and oral presentations and class observations, but at the end of the day, you need something to keep track of progress. And you cannot keep track of progress just with qualitative concepts, just with qualitative scores. You also need quantitative scores so that you can match them together, get data, collect data, and then make a more overall judgment of your student's performance. And watchback in testing depends on the teacher. And let's talk about watchback in a moment, okay? This is all to say that, yes, the process of assessment is a mechanism which carries out a judgment. And a judgment 
that cannot be made within a vacuum. And therefore, whether we like it or not, points of comparison, for example, criteria or standards are necessary and in constant interplay. So with these implicit parameters, it may be difficult for others analyzing the assessment to understand the salient points being prioritized. Explicit parameters go some way towards creating a, a shared forum on assessment and therefore facilitating transparency process. If you want to compare two of your groups to your students, you need to have some points of comparison. Therefore, that is great or the level of achievement of certain criteria. And uh, this also goes with the wash back effect. I don't know if you heard about this, but this is basically teaching to test, okay? Let me just quickly open here the chat. Let me see if I oh, did it open. Okay, so I'll take a look at it in a little. So when we talk about washback effect, means the effect that testing has over teaching, okay? So if some people say washback is negative or positive, some people say regardless if it's negative or positive, there is, there is, it is called only washback. And I'm gonna give you an example. If I am a teacher in a school, at a school, in which at the end, grade 12, grade 11, they need to take a standardized test, an international test, right? And I know that that test, the score that my students will get in that test will have an effect on my job or perhaps the goodwill, the school's goodwill. I'm gonna start teaching to that, to get a good score. So that is a washback effect. I'm gonna be end up teaching to the test, all right? I'm gonna be more specific with another example. Let's think about a school that has a very strength position in the country because their students are excellent in speaking. They go to spelling bees, they go to, I don't know, debate clubs, and they get the best scores. So everybody knows that if you want your students to go to, to sign, if you want your son or your daughter to be good at speaking English, you should take them to the school. If you know that, I'm sure and 100% certain that your teaching will be focused on getting students to be able to speak. How about the others? Well, yeah, they are important, but not as important as that one. That is a washback effect. So we as teachers play an important role in fostering different types of washback. In other words, the beliefs of the teachers are a critical factor in determining the washback effect. So my question for you is, what is the washback effect that you are producing? Don't answer to me, don't worry. I wanna leave it for you. It's a rhetorical question. What is the washback effect that you are producing, that you are enduring, that you are embracing? Because we all do have one. And if I'm way far to one of the, the points for that alone to continue, can I make something to bring it into the middle? All right? Just think about that. So as part of this reflection, we can say that assessment process that is uh, the device to produce judgment, a judgment that can be made in a vacuum, criteria, standards, scores, grades are needed, okay? So let's not feel bad because I use summative assessments, tests and exams in my classes. No, that is also necessary. We need to have that. We cannot just be giving, oh, you're good, you're bad, you need to improve this. Now, how do I collect all of the information? That information creates a context, which is the opposite of the vacuum. Summative and formative assessment as processes made it impossible for formative assessment to be uniquely formative. Why? Because at the end of the day, I'm going to be producing a meeting, a judgment. And when a judgment comes into place, automatically becomes summative. So let's not just go uh, blindfoldly into it's got to be always summative and formative is bad. I'm sorry. It's got to be always formative and summative is bad. No. 
we need to combine both because the assessment journey is not one ingredient recipe, it is the mix of many. And the washback effect is to be considered throughout the assessment journey. Always think about that. What washback effect am I enduring? Am I motivating? Am I facilitating? What is your washback effect? Now, after we have these concepts and we know that we need to start thinking about them, I always go into this lovely, um, let's say, excerpt from Alice in Wonderland. And I think that this, this cat should be, they should have done, should have made some sort of PhD in language testing or educational testing. Because this summarizes everything that means our first step into assessment journey, which is set your learning objective. Set your learning objective. No matter what you do, no matter how good of a teacher you are, no matter how experienced you are, if this is not the first step that you're taking when designing your lesson plans, when designing your assessments, you need to reevaluate yourself as a professional. And now, if you do it, are you doing it all right? Are you doing it properly, how it is meant to be? Now, let's refresh some concepts. And I got to say, that is not that what I want to tell you is the only way and the only path. This is just one of many. But for you to consider that setting the importance of setting your learning objective is here. Because if you don't know where you're going, well, it doesn't matter whatever road we take you there. Are we in the position to risk, to risk our students' learning process just to see, yeah, you know what? Let's see where it ends up. I don't think so. So setting our learning object is the first most important topic that we need to address when planning the methodology, the tactics that I'm gonna use in my classroom, okay? So take a look at some examples here. These are some examples of learning objectives. Students will understand the pattern. Well, I'm going to just you there, OK? What happens with these learning objectives? They are poorly written learning objectives. They are poorly written learning objectives. Why? First. The first one is vague. I don't really know what to do. As students will understand the past, understand, understand. How do I see understanding? How do I see understand? How do I know that they understood? Unmeasurable. How do I know that this objective has been met, has been achieved? Verbose. Too many words. And I've seen this a lot of times when I used to. Um, be consulting schools and universities, and I analyze the first thing that I always do is take the course, the program, and then go into what the teachers do, which means with the lesson planning. And you can see this long, very long objective with many words, with a specific lingo. You say, yeah, well, how about you change to these five words? Oh, okay, clear, because these objectives have also to have, have to be communicated to students. How about this one? And you can see this, this, this mistake you see a lot. The course objective is one, or the unit objective is one, and the lesson or class objective, they don't match. So what can we do? Well, if I find out that I have a, an objective that is vague, I can make it clear and specific. For example, if I have an objective that is unmeasurable, I can have a measurable. For example, if I come across objectives that are very verbose, I can make it concise. And if I see that I have objectives that are independent of course objectives, so I can tie them up. Let's think, let's reflect. When you go home and start preparing your classes for next day, for next Monday, 
think about this. Start by thinking and reflecting on your learning objectives. How is it written? Is it poorly written or is properly written? And remember that no matter what, at least three of these components have to be in a proper, a properly written learning objective. They are, the basic are context, behavioral verb or observable performance, and criteria. Let's just refresh them, okay? So first, context. Nothing happens in a vacuum. Students learn and test in a context. So what will your lesson provide that students can build from, okay? Uh, are they learning from something that they did for the previous class? Are they gonna do something upon a student, a, a, co a, a colleague, a coworker, the teacher, a peer is gonna ask them to do something? What is the context in which that learning objective is going to take place? It's gonna be in a classroom. It's gonna be in a presentation, in a auditorium. It's gonna be in a library while they read or in a blog while they get information and build their own blog. What is the context of your learning objective? Second, and this is basically behavioral verb or observable performance. And let's go back to the first example of a poorly written learning objective that says students will understand simple test. Understand, wow. How do you see understanding? The students will know the conditional. How do you see knowing, right? So when we write our objectives, we need to think how I'm going to observe what performance, what action my student is going to perform that is gonna give me the tools to know whether it has been achieved or not. And how do I get to choose the behavioral verb? Well, the classic and yet very vigilant, very active and very valid concept nowadays is Bloom's taxonomy. I know that most of you know what it is. Let's just go really hot, really quick over it. So Bloom's taxonomy is a taxonomy of thinking. Yeah. So it said that Bloom's in 1950s, and this is funny because it was not uh, only Bloom who came up with this. It came with a group of researchers, but in the paper that it was written, it was of course, uh, as every paper, it is written alphabetically. So the first person, it was B, Bloom, and uh, as there were like four more, it was Boom, Bloom et al. So the et al, they disappeared from history. And just Benjamin Bloom, was put as the single author of this Bloom taxonomy, but he wasn't, okay? He was a whole group, so collaboration that took place. Now, when I'm choosing my verse, my behavioral verse, my performance, I have to think what level of thinking I am, am I aiming at, okay? So think about this, when you're coming down, when you're going to your house and you're preparing your classes for next Monday and you're setting up your objectives, what verbs are you using the most? Are you using lots, which means low order thinking skills? Or are you taking your student a step further with using these verbs, which are part of hot, higher order thinking skills? It's not that the low order thinking skills are wrong or bad, not at all, just that if all your lessons, all your lessons stick to these three first levels, you're not pushing your students into thinking at a higher order. Therefore, go get, go get a Bloom taxonomy and then start using those verbs, using those verbs when you when you write your, your learning objectives, okay? And the final component is criteria. And criteria, how will you know that a student has met their objective, okay? So for example, if you are teaching telling the time, right? And you teach all this, the sentences and the phrases and how to do it. And uh, at the end, you, cre you create your test, a speaking test, 
and you ask a student, please ask the ask for the time to your 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 student, your, your peer. So if a student says, "Can you tell me what the time is? Can you give me the time? What time is it?" So it gets a five. But I don't know if you can see the camera right now. But what if your student does this? Hey. Is he meeting the objective of asking for the time? Yes. If the one that is telling the time says, if he meeting the objective of telling the time, yes. It is what you expected though. Perhaps no. But this is not their mistake, it's ours. Because in the objective, we need to establish exactly what the criteria is. What is it what we're expecting from our students to do? Now, in Oxford University Press, we are committed to improving, to improving our tools and resources in the assessment part. And we know that everybody does assessment journey and we want to contribute with, of course, a set of resources that you can use, a set of tools. For example, we came up with the concept of the four P's, which is we offer progress tests, placement tests, practice tests, and proficiency tests. And these are all part of the assessment journey that can be endorsed or facilitated or supported by Oxford University Press and our materials. So we talk about progress tests are all those tests that are within a series, right? That helps us to see how our students are progressing towards the achievement of the lesson goal. Practice tests are those tests that have been, or our materials that help our students uh, prepare, familiarize for when taking an international exam. We also have placement tests, Oxford placement tests, and Oxford placement tests for young learners, in which gives a grade, a score from pre A1 to C2, evaluates use of English and listening, is a placement test, and tells us exactly where our students are for English, for use of English, for listening, and give us an overall. The Oxford placement test for young learners reports to pre A1 to B2, I'm sorry, to B1, and is used for students, has been contextualized for students between seven and 12 years old. And we have our proficiency test. This test has been out only for four years, but come with uh, more than 15 years of research before launching it, which is the Oxford test of English and the Oxford test of English for schools. This is a certificate. This is it's a proficiency test. A proficiency test that has many advantages. Let me just show you very quickly some of them. This is from one of our uh, fellow country people. The Oxford Test of English is uh, certified by the University of Oxford. It's endorsed by the, one of the best universities in the world. You can trust the results you're going to get. For example, let's hear some words of Professor uh, Khalil 
who is one of his instructors in Saudi Arabia. Now, the Oxford Test of English comes with a for schools version, which has all the features of this Oxford Test of English, but is specifically designed for people between 12 and 16 years. Let's take a look at some comments and testimonials on it. This is from Spain, and this is a teacher who uses Oxford Test of English for her schools in her school. And of course, the Oxford Test of English and the Oxford Test of English for Schools is available in Costa Rica. And one of our test centers is UNED, our, our ally in this democratization of assessment and giving to the public of Costa Rica or Costa Rican people more opportunities to take one exam that is endorsed, certified by University of Oxford, and it's going to help you and your students to achieve their academic goals, social and work goals as well. Okay, it's almost reaching the, uh, the, find the end of our, our talk. I want you to stop sharing right now here. And I want this just to give us this 10 minutes. I should you have any questions. So please, that will be good opportunity. We have nine minutes now. So let me take a look. I'm just looking at the chat right here. All right, I'm going to just start from the top to see. Okay, I got no, this is fine. I just have one question from Akira. <laughs> How do you deal with cognitive or, I'm sorry, I missed that one. Good, Paul, I'm going to get there in a second. Uh, How do you deal with cognitive or language barriers in externalities? Excellent question. So now, when we talk about cognitive barriers, one of the cognitive barriers is where students are, are directing that cognition, that cognitive load that is called. So 
depending on how tests are designed, students will be required to put a high cognitive load into not only demonstrating their English level by answering a question, but also understanding the question. And that goes hand by hand with the fact of strategies. When we're designing tests, we need to also think what type of strategies should students be using in order to answer this question? Okay, do they have to understand a specific mechanics? Do they need to understand the specific type of questions? Or is a transparent question in which they can easily answer it without not much thinking? I mean, not much thinking about the type of question, the format of the question, right? So that cognitive load is one of the aspects that we need to take into consideration when analyzing also if I am designing a test or I am having my students to take a standardized test. Some tests that are very known, very well known, they need people not only to know English, they need to know how the questions are answered. So that cognitive load has to be doubled is twice as much as they were normally would if they won't have to concentrate on demonstrating the NATO, they know English. Tests whose questions are transparent, relatable, family and familiar to test takers, these are the ones in which students reduce cognitive load into the strategies and mechanics of the question, and they can concentrate solely into the answering and evidencing that they know English. I don't know if I answered your question, Akira. Enough, please let me know. And how you deal with it is, well, training, preparation, and familiarization, depending on the type of test that the students can get or that we have to take. Uh, Paula, yes, this is, I'm gonna just go back to the example of uh, video games. So if you're, a, if you're a gamer and you play today, well, what I used to play, uh, well, I used to play Pac-Man and Miss Pac-Man. So let's jump 40, 30 years, uh, let's, let's forward 40 years and let's say that it's Call of Duty. So today you play and you get a thousand points. Tomorrow, when you play again, you want to beat yourself based on the thousand points you got yesterday. So evaluative means evaluating your students or evaluating yourself based on the last one. So if a student gets today a five in an exam, and you're gonna evaluate them based on, based on that file. So what you have to do, an assessment that includes these challenges, these topics that you saw first, plus new ones to see, or in different way, presented in different way, so that this person can show that get a higher grade than the one before. That is the type of assessment. I don't know, Paul, if uh, I was, uh, clear. Basically, I can use the analogy of video games to get it like, they're in the Thank you, All Professor right. Caicedo. We really appreciate no problem, your anytime. answers. Well, I guess that we're coming to the end of the session. Once mm -hmm. again, thank you so much for you, all of you, to be here and to bear with me throughout this hour and a half. Thanks a lot. I want to thank Tobias. I want to thank Akira. I want to thank all net for um, their invitation for me is an honor, an honor to be here. And uh, should you have any question, I think my bio data, you can access my email, you can have access to my email. Please drop me a note for whatever you need, assessment wise, I'm here to help. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend.